Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me today. I do truly appreciate it. I want to talk to you today about a book by Robert McCammon called Mr. Slaughter, and it's the th third book in a series, a Matthew Corbett series by Robert McCammon. And it is historical fiction and set in the very early 1700s in the colonial U.S. Mr. Slaughter is actually set in New York, around New York, kind of between New York and Philadelphia and anyway in that area. And I, uh, I'm i reading right now Providence Writer, the fourth book in the series, and it occurred to me I probably ought to talk about these books because they're really, really good. Now, I got started with Robert McCammon through the normal channels, reading books like Swan Song and Boy's Life and Wolf's Hour and some of those things. And he was writing a series of these, of these historical fiction books set in the colonial times. And, uh, and it, really, it really wasn't exciting to me because that era, reading about that era, I don't know, something about stockings and the outfits and such as that. I just was never a big fan. I was a big fan of Westerns, but not that stuff. But I like Robert McCammon. And so I jumped in and I read Speaks the Nightbird and I loved that book. I read the first half on the way to Alaska on a trip. And I think I finished, or I almost finished the second half on the way back from Alaska. I loved that book, so I had to continue on. And I went on to The Queen of Bedlam, and that book was so great. And then I kind of paused for a little while, and then I jumped on to Mr. Slaughter, and it was phenomenal. Now I'm reading The Providence Writer, it's all so great. One of the problems I have with Mr. Slaughter is right here. I've got a big gap in my Matthew Corbett, in my collection, my limited edition collection, Mr. Slaughter's missing. I need to get one of them one of these days, but I don't want to get my pants pulled down over the price. But anyway, essentially in the beginning on Speaks the Nightbird, there's this young man, Matthew Corbett, who is a clerk, basically a scribe for a magistrate traveling around that area, going from town to town to town, acting as a judge or so, uh, acting as a judge on different cases, and they go to this little bitty village that's struggling, and they've got a witch. <laughs> they've got somebody that they're calling a witch, and uh, the, the judge, the magistrate, basically has to decide, is she a witch? Is she guilty? So they can kill her and move on. And Matthew's not quite so sure. He is a religious young man, but he's not sold. And anyway, great book. I strongly suggest it. And then you move on to Queen of Bedlam. Each one of these books so far is different. Matthew Corbett is the center of attention, but each one is a different type of a story. Queen of Bedlam, he's moved on from being this clerk for a magistrate. Um, read the book, you'll find out. He goes to New York City. I mean, this is 1700-ish, early 1700s. He goes to New York City, and now he's doing the same kind of work for another guy. But he gets a chance to work for an agency, sort of like a detective agency out of London that is also working in New York. Well, practically nobody working for them, just this guy, the great Hudson Great House. Um, they recruit Matthew Corbett, this young guy. He's very, very smart, a great, brilliant mind, a thinker, a problem solver, but not much else in terms of physical attributes, not a tough guy or any of those kinds of things. Well, Hudson Great House is one bad dude. <laughs> He's one bad dude. And so he, he helps to train this young Matthew Corbett, this brilliant guy, this problem solver into the physical arts of sword fighting and shooting and hand-to-hand -hand combat. He's kind of learning. He's not still not a bad dude, but he's learning. He's learning some of these skills. Uh, the Queen of Bedlam is a great story and they have to go solve a problem together, get into a, it develops a lot of the story there in New York, this early New York, but get into scrapes and a major scrape and spoiler alert, there's a lot of books in the series. Matthew comes out in the end. And then we jump into Mr. Slaughter. Now we're, 
We're looking at uh, Matthew Corbett, who has been a problem solver for this sort of detective agency now for a little while. He has got some celebrity because of the stories that came out of Queen of Bedlam. He is famous a little bit. He's starting, he's developed this bit of an ego. He's not a jerk, really, but he's feeling, you know, everybody's telling him how great he is. Everybody's asking him his stories. He feels like he's somebody now. He gets into a little bit of debt, buying fancy clothes and trying to look the part of a gentleman. Fancy clothes, shoes, all duded up. So a little bit of debt. He just doesn't make much money. So it's easy to get in debt. If you're buying nice things and you don't make much money. And at the same time, he goes on a bit of an investigation of his own and he finds some treasure. He decides not to tell anybody. He's going to keep this treasure for himself. He doesn't want to share it because he found it. Nobody else knew what to look for. Nobody else went looking for it. He found this treasure and it's enough that not only can he kind of square his debts, but come out far ahead, have quite a bit of money left to, to take care of himself with. Um, at the same time, both he and the great Hudson Great House are hired to do a job. It should be a relatively simple job to go to this sort of a, an insane asylum sort of a thing, the sanitarium sort of place. Not a sanitarium. It's more of an asylum. And take this criminal called Mr. Slaughter, take him to a ship in, I think, Philadelphia, put him on a ship, send him to London, and he's going to be hung or executed, however they execute him in London, because this guy was a murderer. He was he was a, a barber that sliced and diced people with a razor. Kind of a familiar story. And then he ran and came to the colonies, and there he was a highwayman. So he and a partner would waylay people and steal their money and treasure and kill a lot of people. He was captured, not by any great feat of the capturers, he fell off his horse, got knocked out. So it's easy to get captured when you fall off a horse and get knocked out. And now he's been bound and, and locked up in this asylum for a while. And uh, Matthew Corbett and Hudson Greathouse have to take him on. He's all beat up and abused and weakened and all this stuff because he's been locked up for so long. They really don't feel like he's that much of a threat. Big mistake. I'm not going to give you all the story, but I'm going to go on a little bit. If you feel like you're getting too much story, then uh, go ahead and pause or fast forward or mute it or whatever you want to do. But this Mr. Slaughter, who Hudson Greathouse kind of does abuse a little bit to show him, to put him in his place, because Mr. Slaughter is a tricky talker, silver tongue kind of a guy. He keeps pissing off the great Hudson Greathouse. Matthew Corbett is for good reason, worried and afraid, but he's got a gun. He's okay. They're taking him off. Just get it over with and make their little money and move on. Mr. Slaughter, though, says, I've got a lot of treasure buried on this road up here that we're fixing to pass. And if you don't make a deal with me now, nobody will ever, ever find that treasure. No matter how hard you look, you'll never find it. You'll get your little bit of money and uh, somebody, <laughs> a lot of money will be left buried. And through talking and talking and talking, he finally gets to Hudson Great House. He can't stand it anymore. He and Matthew Hudson kind of helps Matthew to agree to take Mr. Slaughter, go dig up this treasure, and then crawfish. Instead of setting him free like he uh, he's negotiating, lock him back up, take him on, put him on the ship, and send him on his way. He's a murderer, so... Who cares if you cheat a murderer? That's the that's the, the rationality for Hudson Great House. Meanwhile, Matthew Corbett knows he's got this big chunk of money hidden that nobody knows about. And he wants to tell Great House about it so they don't take the risk and all that stuff. But he just can't bring himself to tell him. He wants to keep his money for his own. <clears throat> so they make the deal. And it turns out Mr. Slaughter is a whole lot trickier and a whole lot more physically capable than they expect. So he has set a trap. Hudson Great House is badly injured and left in a little Indian village there, kind of left for dead, but they have a, a medicine people, doctors there, who are using their form of medicine to help him. He's still alive. Matthew Corbett with one of the people in the village there. They go off on a quest to try to capture Mr. Slaughter before he kills more. 
And uh, I don't want to go too much farther into the story here, but it's only now starting to get good. Matthew is riddled with guilt because if he'd only have spoken up, if he would have only overcome his own greed, um, then not only would his friend not be in dire straits, physical problem that he's in right now, but a lot of people who may be killed by this killer wouldn't be put in danger. And it is, it is brutal. There is brutality. It is gruesome. Mr. Slaughter is one bad dude, ba 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 bad. Spoiler alert. It's a long series. It's the Matthew Corbett series. Matthew comes out on the other end a little bit worse for wear, but he comes out again to move on into Providence Rider and the other books along the way. Another neat little interesting point of the story, which continues on with the series, at least in the Providence Rider, which I'm almost done with now, is there is a, a slave, this ancient, this warrior from an African tribe that's notorious for being unbelievable warriors. He's been brought to the United States and he's working for this, uh, this guy at a funeral parlor. He's helping this guy out. Um, he's had his tongue cut out. He can't speak. He doesn't know English. One of the things that Hudson Greathouse was hoping to be able to do with his share of the treasure, had they gotten it, was to be able to buy this guy's freedom and hopefully recruit him to help them in their, their agency, their problem-solving agency, and ultimately for this guy to be able to protect Matthew Corbett, who he fears, because Matthew Corbett is such a curious fellow, such a determined fellow and a smart fellow, he sometimes gets himself into problems that physically he might not be able to get out of. So he's hoping that this character will help him, and he's He's a neat addition. Plus, uh, Matthew Corbett has a sort of a relationship with a young lady, Barry. Not exactly his girlfriend, although he wants her to be, but he can't because at the end of Queen of Bedlam, he had a price put on his head, essentially a card with a bloody thumbprint on it or a bloody print on it that essentially says Corbett is dead from this mysterious Professor Fell one of the great crime lords in England who's trying to do the same stuff in the in the colonies. And so Mr. Slaughter and the Providence Rider both get deep deeper and deeper into this Professor Fell character. And I think that's um, it's about where I want to leave it. But speaks to Nightbird. Flippin' fabulous. I strongly recommend it. The Queen of Bedlam, even better. Even better than that. Although I will still say Speaks the Nightbird's my favorite so far, just because I like the development of this young Matthew Corbett. And I like the world and all that stuff and the adventures that he has. Queen of Bedlam gets really, really good. It turns it into something different, a different type of story, more of that detective type of a deal. Mr. Slaughter takes it yet again into another story. So he's chasing. Uh, Matthew Corbett and his friend that he just met in the village there are chasing a killer over the hills, over the river, and through the woods, and through little towns and homes and things like that. This killer is unstoppable, seemingly, and they've got to stop him. Along the way, he's ruthless. He kills anybody who he who he might take a notion to kill. They got a pair of shoes. He'll kill them for it. Doesn't matter to him. He does not care. So this is more of that that chase, that hunt, the hunter who probably can't stop the hunted when he finds them. So it's that type of a story. And then Providence Rider again, something completely different. So it's great stuff. You're not just reading more and more of the same so far. Every story is different. So far, every story is great. So Mr. Slaughter, how do I rate it? If you care. However you want to call it, five stars, ten stars, one million stars, I'll say five out of five. Absolutely fabulous book. I would not hesitate to recommend it to anybody. Another thing you might ask, do I have to read the books in order? And I would say absolutely yes. A lot of series books, the authors do a great job of trying to make it to where you could jump in at any point and they'll kind of catch you up, but they don't rely so heavily on you having to know what happened in prior books. And Robert McCammon does a little bit of that, but I think in this series, he puts a little less effort into trying to get you caught up or into kind of nurse feeding you and making sure that 
you know the things just by reading this that you need to know that happened in the other books so you'll be able to keep up. He puts a little, seems like he puts less effort into that and he's just telling another story in the Matthew Corbett series. So some of this stuff you'll need to know, some of the stuff you may not need to know, but you won't really know what they're referring to if you haven't read previous books. So I recommend you start at the beginning and read through in order. I usually will recommend that, but a little bit more so on this Matthew Corbett series. Another interesting thing that I found is each book kind of will give you a little seed for the next one. It might just be some random throwaway line or something like that, or a chance meeting of a character that it'll mention in passing that will come into play in the next book. So that's also fun. I don't know what you call it. Easter eggs, whatever seeds I call it. You find some neat little stuff like that. But I think, in my opinion, as much as I love Robert McCammon and the work he's done, he is at his absolute best in this Matthew Corbett series. I don't know if it's, if it's passion. He's passionate about this stuff. He quit writing because this is what he wanted to write and publishers didn't want to buy it because people don't want to read historical fiction. So it is, it's his passion. I, I don't, I can't speak for the guy, but Robert McCammon, in my opinion, is at his absolute best in the Matthew Corbett series. And that's no insult intended to books like Swan Song or Boy's Life. But this Robert McCammon, to me, is the best Robert McCammon. Anyway, I can think of no more lies to tell, and I've been talking enough anyway. So thanks for your time. I do truly appreciate it. It's good talking to you. Good seeing you. You're looking good. This New Year's seems to be treating you well. And I hope it continues. C'est la vie, baby. Doo-doo.